Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. It's hosted by BTRM on tabletop crisis simulation management for bank boards and ALCOs. My name is Chris Westcott, and I'm one of the faculty members at BTRM. I'll be your host for this session. BTRM itself, or Bank Treasury Risk Management, is a professional qualification. But today we're talking about BTRM as a provider of a specific advisory service for banks. Joining me in this discussion are Professor Morad Chowdhury, founder of the BTRM. Uh, wave, Morad, so they know it's you. And uh, Professor Michael Icorn, who's a member of the BTRM and lead editor of the recently published first dedicated book on reverse stress testing in banking. Uh, that was published by De Gruyter as part of the Morag Chowdhury Global Banking Services. Uh, so welcome guys. Thank you very much. So for our participants, if you've got any questions during the discussion, please can you enter them in the chat facility that I know a number of you have uh, had a practice on. So, uh, kicking off the webinar, Morad and Michael, what exactly is this new service that uh, you're offering? Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, let me kick off and I'm going to leave the detail to Michael because uh, he's the expert on this really. Um, uh, but thank you again uh, and hello and welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, so, this service is essentially the provision of um, uh, an assessment, a provision of assessment of a board, a bank's board or its ALCO, its asset liabilities committee's um, ability to respond effectively and quickly to a stress event or a disruption event indeed. I've just been talking to someone about operational resilience, so it could be something like that. So it's a simulation exercise. We, we specifically look at liquidity risk in the example that Michael's going to talk about, but uh, th th there's no reason we couldn't uh, extend this simulation approach to any kind of disruption or stress event and the reason we call it the flight simulator uh, approach is because it's the analogy is, is is to me perfect it's basically giving banks an ability to train for a crisis practice for a stress event so when an actual one comes along the institution in the form of its board and its alco members are in a better position to respond effectively and efficiently it's and it's this assessment that is that is really a, a, the, the 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 training process, similar to a fire drill, but not quite in the same mould. And Michael's going to talk a bit more later about why it isn't quite like a regulator required fire drill. And that's a good point for me to cue him in. Michael, do you want to talk a bit more about uh, this uh, this provision or this this assessment that uh, that the BTRM is now in a position to to offer? Yeah, thank you, Mara. I, I think the. Like the key points to highlight is maybe to, to start with the motivation, what motivated us to uh, provide this offer. And there, are, I, I think there were three main inspirations that uh, triggered um, what is now the tabletop simulation. The first one is that during the COVID crisis, when we had discussions within the BTM faculty, we realized that most of us served in war rooms, in different crisis events, in different banks. And where we all agreed on was that already in the war room, there were new learnings that already during the crisis, during the crisis, led to the revision of playbooks. And then maybe most importantly, after the crisis, practice changed further. So that was one, one part. And then what also was repeatedly mentioned was that as part of this so-called lessons learned initiatives that banks initiated on their own, feedback from boards and ICOs was repeatedly, repeatedly that they believe that tabletop simulation would be a very beneficial and helpful mechanism to prepare for future crisis events, as you just said, Maura. So that was one, the BTM experience and, and, and banking practice feedback from boards and ICOs. I think the second inspiration was we, we looked what are other sectors doing? We looked benchmark beyond banking. And yeah, the obvious examples are well known. I think in the military, you perform maneuvers, firefighters burn down houses. To, to, to train and pilots are trained in, in very expensive flight simulators. So there must be something in this method, but we didn't stop there. We also looked what is being done for other risk types. And then for example, for cyber risk, we realized that 
IBM is running its own laboratory where they invite it's not only banks but um, all kinds of firms to simulate a, a cyber attack and how they would respond to it. So benchmarking was the second strand, and the third strand or second third inspiration was recent academic research. There's a growing body from uh, behavioral research, but also from organizational theory and, and other disciplines, a growing body that suggests that we need to deal with uncertainty differently. We need to start to embrace uncertainty. And rather than to try to pinpoint and then chase one particular scenario, we should prepare for multiple scenarios and should make sure that we are agile and flexible. And that also includes uh, new agile tools. Again, many of them are are bought from uh, flight pilots or even fighter pilots. Uh, and all have in common that they aim for a more structured and more agile approach. And this is what we'd like to train. So in summary, three inspirations, uh, a, a huge experience from, from prior class by, by the BTM faculty, number one. Number two, the benchmarking experience from other sectors that prove that this type of intervention can be helpful. And then also the growing body of academic research. Maybe I stop here. Thanks very much, Michael. Absolutely, yes. And, I, and the, the I think the first and the third principles, well, the second and the third principles certainly tie closely together. It's, uh, the, the, for example, the flight simulation approach. But the training is 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 such that when when the the student is or the person being about to be awarded their 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 their, their license or their check ride pass, they, they don't know. There's an examiner in the cockpit or the simulator with them who they wouldn't have seen before. It's not their their, their normal instructor. It could be from within the organisation or without. Um, so that the, the examiner is someone they don't know, and the nature of the stress event. Let's make it relevant to banking. Uh, is unknown. It's it's a complete surprise. But the 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 examiner will basically flip a switch or do or or, or, or put in some scenario such that the emergency is then upon. The, the student or the, the pilot uh, trainee, and they've got to respond effectively. And that's in the simulator, and that's practicing for the emergency. So when it happens in real thing, they go through that process. And I think it's an excellent approach. We're going to discuss it a bit more, but I would say that is it's our idea. But uh, I think it's the, we want to discuss it a bit more, how you, you, you mentioned about training the memory muscle, how we can make that happen in practice. So the analogy, I think, is good. Let's go into some detail. Let's look at the simulation exercise itself. You, you mentioned the three principles. Um, on, on point one, banking practice, how how would you describe, how would you say you've translated the experiences of BTRM faculty, which are real world experiences, as you quite rightly mentioned, into a simulation? How interactive would the simulation that the BTRM would set up for an institution, how interactive would it be? Uh, thank you. I think it's a very good question. So before I go through that, maybe it's worth mentioning that um, we offer both. We offer in-person classroom settings and we also offer virtual settings. So this simulation can be used by any bank across the globe. Um, in both cases, it will be highly interactive. Let me explain why. What we will do is we will invite participants in the war room and then they will face between 40 and 60 questions which are derived from real life crisis experience. So we replicate crisis experience from BTM members. All questions will be presented in a quiz format, meaning that apart from making this enjoyable, um, <laughs> means that participants have to choose between different course of action. So we will give them option, you want to do that or do you want to do that? Yeah. And then this won't be easy and then clear cut uh, decisions. We will also provide time frames, so they, they will really be put in a, in, a, in a stressful situation where they have to make decisions in a short period of time. And we will inject further challenges, one after the other, as it happens in a crisis. Um, so we replicate, we replicate um, real life experience, and we can also tailor it further to the need. In order to make it interactive, if, if you operate in the classroom, obviously, um, we can interact in, if it's virtual, we use voting tools, and then uh, we have tested this with, with a cohort in APEC, and it worked very well with, with um, voting tools and breakout rooms. Um, but after all of this intervention and after the participants have made the decisions and then on, on the prior questions, there's a two-way uh, reflection process. First, a reflection in, in the war room because people may have run out of time and then may want to feed something back. And then secondly, and you mentioned the instructor before, 
Secondly, they will get feedback from the BTM uh, faculty. And the idea is that this reflective type of learning and also getting recommendations from, from uh, BTM faculty members with, like Chris have served as uh, treasurers. Um, and I think that that's a added value and an and added learning over and above this interactive um, setup. Okay, thank you. Now, um, before we, uh, you wanted to, sh uh, I was going to ask about some examples to show us. Um, before we do, I, I, we, we like the um, uh, the quiz format. You know, you've, you're, you're given a, 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 a set, a scenario and asked and given different choices. And of course, the, the participant will pick their choice. Is one able to then give a further scenario assuming that choice such that that choice results in this scenario which they need to make a further decision on so in other words you mentioned interactive if there's a choice of oh there's this this has happened there's a liquidity stress event are you going to do one of these four things if they all picked option c or the majority of them let's say are we then able to show what's going to happen as a result of picking option c in a way that would be different to is if they, the majority had picked option a for example is it that detailed as well can they see the impact of their decision making in the next phase of the simulation they can to a large extent. The other thing they can clearly see is um, what, based on the BTM recommendations, um, the impact right. would be of, of doing it or not doing it. Yes, excellent. I, I wanted to bring that out because that, to me, was the real value add. So you've, let's, just, let's, let's, hmm. let's make it straightforward. So there is a stress event. It's a market-wide one. It's impacting your liquidity. What are you going to do? It could be, and I know you've got some examples, so I'll leave you to talk through those in a second, Michael. But um, So you have four choices. If, if the ALCO decides to go with option C, we'll show them what the result of that would be. But at the same time, if, if the BTRM recommendation was option B, we can show them what that would have been as well. And then they can make a, a post-exercise comparison, which will then assist learning further, won't it, right? Absolutely. And yeah. it's still, the whole idea is that it's reflective learning and then, uh, that it triggers a foot for thought in terms of which area should I focus on, what options do I have, and, then, and maybe also where should I reconsider current practices. Okay. Okay. Now, um, did we give? Did you want to show at this point? I wanted to. I had a question on um, on your principle number two, benchmarking with you know uh, other other industries. Um, did you want to before we do that, uh, give an example or two to illustrate this? Yeah, I'm happy to to give an example. So yeah, I've I've, I've chosen three examples. Um, this is the first one. So prior to this, also going back to what Moore said before. At the outset of the simulation, we will provide a, a crisis event that really puts you in, in, in into a setting uh, and it will be a combined crisis event which has uh, market-wide elements but also idiosyncratic components and then one of the first questions we will ask is about the organizational arrangements so things like who do you invite into the war room uh, which am i do you um, prepare and which am i have you currently planned for or do you engage external people to support you as we know some gz banks do so that that will result in, in open questions like this, where we ask, um, how, what am I do you prepare or what is a, do you've got an appropriate playbook and a rule book to say what will be provided to the executive board, what will be provided uh, to regulators and which items feature there and then what's the shape and design of, of this. And then you have to remember that you are in a crisis situation, you are in an emergent uh, and an immense pressure and then um, urgent need to react. So that would be one example. Maybe the second example is even more intuitive and of what we're trying to achieve. So what you see on this slide are questions with regard to how do you calibrate your liquidity buffer? And this question, I think, plays out both. It plays out prior to the crisis. And of course, then during the crisis, it plays out with regard to the usage of the buffer. And what we have done on this slide, we have put two two opposing views, the man on the left-hand side and then the lady on the right-hand side, what they think is the right stance is. And we will discuss it with, with delegates and participants of the war room, and they have to make a decision which one they follow. And without giving it away, but uh, what I can say is that when we've spoken to peers, um, they said that some, in, in their view, prior to for example, the COVID crisis would have voted on one side, and after the COVID crisis, would have voted with. They would have made a different decision, and one treasurer actually called it. A, to him, it was a price discovery. This question, um, 
But we won't stop there. We will also discuss this. what role does two different regulators play, may different regulators take a different stance here. What's the difference between using pillar one buffers and pillar two buffers? Maybe certain regulators are more willing to use pillar two buffers. And we would also discuss, is there an expectation to stay compliant in, in all crises, or does it depend, to which extent does it depend on severity? And, and that's a really hot topic right now, because yeah. you're going to get different answers to that question. Sorry, Michael, was there any more on that slide? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, maybe just to um, close off it. There's also, what we will also do is we will use ECB stats and EBA stats and then and, uh, to highlight what banks have actually done post the crisis. And that's all part of this reflective process that I mentioned before. If, um, would we, uh, let's say an institution wanted us to, to talk to them and they were based outside the European Union um, and indeed the UK, um, we'll, is there, a, it, that's, that's reasonably straightforward to get the relevant statistics from their jurisdiction, right? Uh, I know it's very straightforward for you and I to get uh, EBA and ECB stats, but uh, uh, that, that doesn't mean this is restricted, this exercise would be restricted to EU zone uh, uh, banks, no. right? No, by no means. What we recommend yeah. if, if a bank is asking for the simulation, we recommend that they appoint a point of contact and then we will tailor the scenario, tailor the questions, right. and also tailor the yeah. stats. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Did you have another? Yes, yeah. excellent. <laughs> Maybe one, one more example. Uh, one, one question that I, I find really intriguing is pre trade approval um, controls and the effectiveness in a crisis. And again, you can see here four statements that we have come across in the, in the faculty and um, in, in, in different banks. And we would ask um, delegates which which views they sh share and support. And the consequence also to more earlier question may be that maybe that they say, no, we, we refrain from pre-trade controls and then other people may vote that they want to introduce pre-trade controls and they want to do it immediately. And they may even want to lower the thresholds and close the close the floodgates and then that would be the discussion here and and then well we again we won't stop there we will then also ask uh, how do you track this uh, which reports do you establish who do you report this to and also are these options mutually exclusive or can they be complementary that's the type of questions we will discuss with you and um i think we've got very strong evidence that for specific crisis statements one statement may be more beneficial than the other, and then we will reflect this with, with delegates. Okay, great. Yes. Now, this, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that, uh, uh, well, first of all, I'm hoping that our, our chair of the panel today, Chris, is, is getting something out of this that's that, uh, tickling his fancy, because from your experience uh, of ALCOs, uh, Chris, um, actually, Michael, could we go back to that first slide you showed? Uh, that question there about the, the last question. That, yes, that one there. That bottom question there. From your experience of Alcos, Chris, uh, would you think that if we if we had the Alco in the room and we asked them that question, you're going to get? And there were ten people in the room. You're going to get in various different forms ten different answers, aren't you? <laughs> because that's going to really make them think, right? Because just that one question, they're all going. All the questions I think will make them think. But just that last one you'd get 10 different varieties, wouldn't you? There'd be some commonality, but they would not agree on the same set of metrics, would they? I, I, it's fair to say everybody has their favourite. Um, <laughs> you, you would hope that uh, um, there would be a degree of commonality at the kind of global level, yeah. um, uh, because within Treasury, we're concentrating on certain risks and uh, I'd expect all banks to concentrate on the same group of risks at the global level, but everybody's going to have their favourite within yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. That would be quite interesting to set these questions. And indeed, the questions on the HQLA, you're going to get slightly different answers. On Michael's slide just now, it would be really interesting to see around the room the different opinions, thank you, Michael, about uh, you know the answer to that. Because th th there's, so typical in banking and finance, there's more than, wife, more than one right answer to quite a few of those questions, isn't there, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. That's and, and that's the idea, and that's what reality means. There is yeah. no black or white. So we're really trying to bring out the the, the different shades of grey that decision makers face in a crisis. Yeah, and I think the value that I'm seeing here is that depending on the answer that, as a collective, the ALCO or the board gives, we'll be able to show them. Well, this is what happened then. So therefore, now what do you say? Now what do you say? And I think there's some some really good. This, that's hence the flight simulator. Um, analogy okay let me um let me go back to um the next let me go on to the next uh, point that i want to raise you mentioned in your three principles the first one was banking practice the second was benchmarking with other with other industries and sectors um and i had a question on that michael 
your analogy to simulations, for example, in the military or indeed you talk about fire, firefighting, uh, military pilot training, that, that we've, I, again, I think that's a, that's very well, very apposite analogy, absolutely spot on. Uh, but um, I just want to ask, because I'm sure some of our delegates will be thinking this, banks already perform regulator driven or regulator required simulations to test their, for example, their, their contingency funding plan, or in the UK, it's now called the liquidity contingency plan, the LCP, but same sort of document, CFP, LCP, they already do this sort of fire drill test. Um, how does this tabletop simulation that we're discussing, how does that differ from, um, from the regulatory driven annual fire drill exercise, for example? Yeah, I, I think it's very very valid question and and you are you're right banks do already perform annual tests of uh, their contingency funding plan or liquidity contingency plan we actually think as a, as a btm faculty that some that some banks may want to kill two birds with one stone because we think the simulation can actually be used and integrated in, in into the regular testing with so it's a short sharp intervention tailored that we can tailor and as such um it can be part of this but i think there are two nevertheless two key differences one is that we think by by design the simulation is broader in the sense that at least from some of the banks we know we have seen that they follow one scenario and they test if the bank is able to withstand um, a certain liquidity shock with or without management actions and then to discuss management actions what we are doing with the simulation is while we use the lead scenario the decisions that are flagged are informed by various scenarios from 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 different banks. Uh, so as such, it is broader, and then we will inject, as I said before, we will inject new challenges all the time, and then delegates will not know what's around uh, the, the corner. But it's also brought up in design in the sense that we also challenge uh, organizational arrangements, like who do you invite? Uh, what am I do you provide? And then that we also challenge protocols. Uh, so, for example, uh, how do you deal with rebalancing between different entities? Do you, and we may even identify that there are, are gaps in protocols. Um, so, in, in, in that sense, it's, it's in, as you said before, it's someone who the war room participants do not know and who may bring a whole new, whole new set of ideas. That's one difference. The other key difference I'd like to highlight, and I think that's the really the key difference is that there's an instructor by that. So the BTM faculty members will work as instructors, allowing this reflective learning that I emphasized before. The best analogy that I can think of, it's like, of course you can train yourself to how to fly a plane, but wouldn't it be much more efficient to have an instructor by your side? And then likewise, for me, it's having a driving lesson with an instructor and then, and then reflecting after the lesson what what can be improved and then what went well and what maybe areas to uh, follow up on. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. Absolutely. I think having that person who isn't part of the firm, um, but um, can act as an instructor using their own background and experience as well, as well as taking into account the experience of the institution itself. I can see how that has value. I wanted to ask, this is also designed or, well, in theory, at least the maximum value is had um, by doing this at quite short notice, isn't it? So um, it's not set in the diary three months in advance. The idea is the, the examiner, yeah, the, the person running the simulation, which is going to be BTRM here, would 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 uh, would, would arrange with the sponsor of this engagement uh, a time to come in. That would be set in advance. But the individuals involved, the ALCA members, they that they would be expecting something, but not know exactly when it was. So it's unannounced because that's the thing about. Uh, to me, I think that's another difference between a fire drill for LCP purposes and this tabletop simulation. Stress events don't come advance in the diary, do they? We don't put a date in the diary, you know, next Wednesday, three o'clock, to go through this fire that you would for a fire drill to make sure everyone can make their diaries. They come unannounced. And an ability to practice for that, I think, has value. It might, you know, cause some senior execs a bit of consternation, the, the idea of their, a part of their diary being, you know, uh, not in under their control. But I think an additional value that one doesn't get through the more uh, formulaic fire drill and CFP test is the fact that it's not known exactly what's going to happen, which is what the real world is like. You don't know when the stress event is going to happen. You know, we didn't know on the um, the 17th of March, 2023, that on the 23rd, we wouldn't be able to leave the house without, uh, well, I was about to say police escort, but that wasn't in the UK. That was in some jurisdictions. Uh, so I think that also has value. The fact that there's the instructor in the room, you, you certainly, I certainly would want to learn how to 
to, to from my from my cadet days. <laughs> uh, I didn't get as far as a license. I certainly want to learn how to fly by 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 reading the book. I'd want the instructor in the room. But having the instructor uh, and someone who isn't part of the firm, I think, also has value. And you know, that's 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 well pointed out. Absolutely. Um, and I also sorry, think yeah. just one just one point. I think that's also it helps to to test if you got the right bench strength. If and if if you're able and and yeah, the other point you mentioned, I think. That's the nice thing about the simulation. You don't know what's happening on the next day. Even once you're on the quest, you don't know yeah. uh, what's around. The, and then during COVID, this was a golden question. And then, and so you can really test it in a in a realistic yeah. setting. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, that's our principles. Did you want to say anything about your third principles in academia um, before uh, I hand back to Chris? Um, was there anything that you wanted to point out about the value that can be had by looking? Um, at what academia has published just in just this space, uh, which I think is of relevance to banks. Yes, um, there's, as I said, there's a growing body of, of academia, but maybe I picked just three examples briefly. There's uh, one professor, um, Schumacher from Wharton University, he's saying we should think new about this um, uncertainties. He said we are locked in our current frames, we would only see a limited range of uncertainties. Um, we would find it difficult to challenge our mental models, therefore this external intervention can be helpful. And he said a lot of banks are, when it comes to a crisis, are like pilots flying through rain and fog and then follow more their gut instinct than, uh, than anything else. And therefore he's suggesting to experience, to ask banks to experience a crisis and then to prepare not for one, or not try to pinpoint one specific crisis but to prepare for a range of crises. So that would be one inspiration. The other inspiration that, that I found was from uh, the, the chair of the Systemic Risk Center, uh, John Danielson from London School of Economics. He's highlighting that he thinks a lot of the banks assume that the scenario event will be exogenous, so a monolith will drop on the bank. And he thinks many of the risks are endogenous, so something that amplifies throughout the financial system that hits the bank. and then. From his work, I can actually think of a whole new set of scenarios. Um, he's also highlighting that um, we, we tend to focus on the known unknowns and then asking us to think also about the unknown unknowns, which again supports um, an, an external intervention. He's saying the risks we know we prepare for, but it's a risk we don't know that are most damaging. Um, he's got views on, on, on the role of politics and then the retail risk. And he thinks market data indicators and signals often send market data indicators often send signals too late. So you are already in the crisis. Yeah. And um, there are various other points, but his short message is basically in one sentence that he thinks we are searching in the wrong places. And then uh, it's suggesting from from his work, I got inspired to think about new scenarios. Well, well, that's a very valid. That's a very well pointed out reference um, uh, because. Uh, some of that struck a chord. We, you know, we, we've we've got to train for a range of them because we don't know what the final is going to look like. And I think moving outside of the more formulaic ICAP and ILAP stress testing process and the scenario forming, uh, I know lots of jurisdictions they don't even ask for a storyboard. You just assume defaults increase by X percent, or assume outflows of liquidities is Y percent. There's no storyboard around it. I think actually training for various different type you know, as you said, the unknown unknowns. Not that I want to quote, ever want to be known as quoting Donald Rumsfeld. I'd rather quote this professor, actually, <laughs> Schumacher from Wharton, than Donald Rumsfeld. Um, but you're right. I think the best way to work for that is to train across the range of them. So when the real one comes along at short notice, unannounced, unexpected, uh, we're able to respond because we've practiced for it. The point about early warning is very well made as well. Here in the UK uh, and, and other jurisdictions, I know that the regulator is keen for banks to, to report and monitor early warning indicators, but so many early warning indicators I see in a suite of risk metrics in banks, uh, risk appetite statement, they are lagged indicators. By the time they're telling you a number that you don't like, you're already in the crisis, you're already in the stress event. So again, a short, uh, a short notice instant instant stress event is, is is good training and that's why i like the idea of calling on their diary at reasonably short notice because the stress event doesn't occur at a time that you've put in your diary that you've got to drop everything assemble in the boardroom or what have you the, the meeting room or virtually and get up gather, gather everyone around and then discuss all these different uh, issues so um all very good points thank you now those are the three principles we've discussed I'm going to hand back to to Chris, who I think uh, you you have a couple of points you want to raise, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you, Morad. Uh, I 
I've got a few questions myself before I uh, throw it open to the floor. So uh, it's been a really interesting discussion, but is this something that's really new for banking? For instance, are, th are there any other providers of this kind of service? I, I, I can't, um, sorry, Michael, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any, but uh, in the format we're suggesting, but uh, perhaps uh, Michael, do, do, do you know? Yeah, no, I'm not aware of, of anything either. And then certainly, certainly the content, content is unique. Um, and then I couldn't find any comparable offers for liquidity risk. And that's, okay. Yeah. I, I just want to emphasize that um, this exercise can be extended beyond a liquidity risk scenario, can't it, Michael? We could address capital risk or reputational risk. Uh, could we not? It's it's not limited to 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 test to to, to planning or sorry, practicing for liquidity stress, is it? It's just that we've used this as an example to illustrate, right? That's right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, Chris. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. And uh, thinking about the the beneficiaries of this uh, kind of approach, who who do you see? could benefit, or put that another way, what's your target customer segment? I'm going to leave that to Michael. Uh, uh, Mr. Icorn, what, uh, <laughs> Professor, Dr. Icorn, I should say, what do you think is our uh, target customer segment for this uh, for this service provision? Yeah, I would actually split it in two parts when I answer. The first part would be that I think that all financial firms can benefit, certainly any regulated financial institutions and especially banks. And so that would be my first part. The second part, if you then ask yourself, who within the banks, which members of the banks, I would think that we are particularly targeting the members of the firm who will sit in the war room, who will sit in the war room should the firm face a liquidity or other crisis. And they will benefit the most from this. Right. Episode. And so you mean, uh, let's try and tie this down. You mean, I, I would have thought at one level, it's going to be the Asset Liability Committee. So all the members, the voting members of the Asset Liability Committee. But uh, from my experience, from my uh, Arab bank days during the Lehman's crisis, uh, we, we, um, the, the CEO assembled a, a sort of alpha team of the board, which was essentially the CEO, the CFO, the CRO, and the head of commercial banking. And the four of them met uh, every morning and at the end of each day for about 10 days post Lehman's. So it, was, it wasn't the board as a whole. Um, in that instance, the chair was actually based overseas. And in those days, there was no virtual meeting. I suppose you'd want at the board level, the decision makers would be the chair and then the C-suite that I've mentioned. But Ultimately, if it's a liquidity stress, it's going to be ALCO members, or potentially a shortened down version of the board, right? Absolutely, exactly. And that's so exactly the people who, if there was a real crisis, would decide. And then, and therefore, we we would then that would be one of our first questions to banks who would okay. sit. In. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had another question actually. Um, you, you, can I ask about the the simulation exercise? That we've just been discussing everything we're discussing here this tabletop uh, simulation exercise for any type of stress event um I, because regulators all around the world couch the risk management framework of the banks they supervise within the framework of the lines of defense either three lines of defense or four lines of defense can i just ask about how this exercise would fit within the framework of the three or four lines of defense is the simulation equally relevant for for members of the second and third line, as well as I would have assumed right away, the first line of defense? 100%. Uh, so what we have done is if you go through the questions, you will see that there are two set of questions. One is directed at the first line. So things like it's talking about forecasting, it's, it's asking about challenging of, of the funding plans so or re, revision of the funding plan in a crisis, or it's also covering the question, which markets do you access in a crisis in which order with, with which volume? Um, and then there's a second set of questions which cover things like risk controls, uh, risk metrics, uh, stress testing, which usually resides with the second line. And then um, they nicely interplay because, as you said before, we would expect that, the, that there are representatives of both lines in the war room, and then we would confront the, the war room with this. So, and then I think also for internal audit, a third line of defense, they would, they would uh, also be worthwhile. Um, having a look at this because you can see uh, how well uh, the, the setup works and then where there are potential areas for improvement. But it understood. Covers, covers it end to end. No, understood. I I, um, I was going to ask before you, thank you for raising the, the internal order. I was going to ask that because in many banks around the world, it's increasingly more common, commonly observed to see a representative from internal audit attending the ALCO. They're not voting members, but they attend it. I think 
I was about to ask, is there value in, in the rep from the internal audit being involved in this exercise? I would have thought yes, but you, you've answered that. Yes, I, we can see the value there because they're part of the, the review and assurance process, aren't they? They might review ALCO effectiveness. They might review decision making at the ALCO. Um, they might review the culture of the ALCO. You know, is it a genuine debating body? So their input, if they are attending ALCO, would be beneficial to both to all parties if they also attended this simulation, right? Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. And and I would expect that, given the, the rich and versatile uh, experience across the VTM faculty, I would expect that there may also be aspects, one or two or even potentially more, that maybe no one in the bank has thought about before and that internal audits then can make sure um, get considered in a, in a structured and, and raised and then tracked in a structured way. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, I, I've, I've uh, I, I think that uh, covers it for me. Uh, Chris, back to you, sir. All right. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. Um, so just before we finish, uh, I think we need to see if there's any questions from the floor at all. So uh, those guys who are online, uh, we've mentioned if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat facility. Um, uh, so we'll just give you a moment to do that. Um, and if there aren't any, we'll move to wrap up. But let's uh, let's see for a moment. Okay, I, I'm going to work for now that, that people are still thinking about questions uh, or perhaps they'd rather send them to us separately. Um, so just before we finish, Morad and Michael, uh, your final thoughts from each of you first, uh, maybe Michael? There, there was one question. Do you consider the simulation part of the reverse stress testing exercise? Oh, yes, I've just seen that. Yes, sorry. I've just oh, seen that, that as well. Sorry, Chris, I hadn't seen it either. I'm really sorry that. Oh yeah, it's just coming now. Just, sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we're really sorry, David. My apologies. Um, so, uh, as you guys have seen it, uh, uh, have a go, uh, Michael. What do you think? I, I think it can be. So, the, the way I think about this, almost, I, I think about stress as a continuum. From and then I would consider market-wide stress at 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 uh, con somewhere left on the continuum, so severe, but not extremely severe. And then I would think other scenarios, combinations of market-wide and idiosyncratic stresses, really severe idiosyncratic stresses at the other end of the spectrum or the continuum. And in, if you play out the scenario that is so severe uh, that it qualifies to be on the, on the far right of the continuum, uh, then it can also be used uh, for reverse stress testing purposes. And actually, uh, that's something I've also done something I've also done before. So it's a question of severity, um, but in general, the simulation concept itself also holds for this high severity event. Maybe it's particularly relevant then. I mean, it certainly can be, uh, and I agreed completely everything you said, Michael. I, personally, I think the value of this is that, is, is, is that it isn't part of the reverse stress testing. In so far as we want to, we want to, well, that's not we. The the the, the ALCO, the board and the Al the board and or the ALCO of a bank want to determine for themselves how effective they would be in responding to a crisis. We saw from last year that, um, and my experience, my observation is is limited to UK banks, but I, I I dare say this is replicated around the world. We saw from last year that when lockdown was introduced and it was at reasonably short notice, um, there was a range of responses from banks. One or two banks, I don't need to name them here, but uh, in, in, one or two banks more or less carried on as normal. They, they didn't turn away new customers. They carried on uh, ex servicing existing customers. And one or two banks, I know of basically without announcing it, shut up shop. They were, they were managing their existing customers, but they didn't open new accounts. They didn't consider new business. And there was a large number of banks in the middle, you know, adjusting to see, taking decisions, taking time to make decisions, deciding to what extent they could carry on doing business. What they had to bring this, how much they had to bring business down. And I'd like to think that it was the banks that had a more effective adaptability and response to crisis event ability. In other words, an ability to make decisions quickly and adapt to changing events. 
I think it was those banks that were better able to service their customers on an ongoing basis. And I think that's what we're, we, all banks need to practice for. Uh, the idea that you, you, you practice for a stress or across a range it, it, through a various processes. It's just not one event. It's not just an annual fire drill. It's over very, three or four times in the year. You practice uh, through, a, say, a, a three, four hour session in the day and you come away with a learning based on the simulation and the outcomes. And this means when a real stress comes along at short notice, unannounced, unexpected, you your your mind kicks into action and as a collective as an alco or as a board their decision making is more efficient and in that respect i think the the maximum value out of this from what i'm understanding from michael saying is that it's it's part of the training for stress event training for managing doing stress events process then it is a pure stress testing exercise to see here's the stress event What's the impact on our balance sheet? It's, so it's it's connected. It's very closely connected to an ICAP and an ILAP, the way I see it. But it's it's something subtly distinct. So certainly using the simulations and extending the severity can mean we can use them in positive risk stress testing. And indeed, um, there's no reason why one shouldn't. But really, if you consider it as a, as a parallel track to the formal stress testing process, the ICAP and the ILAP and the recovery plan, which and the ICAP and ILAP require you to have a reverse stress test in it. If we have a parallel track where the executives and the non -exec, certain non-execs are training for a stress event, I think that's where the real value of this comes across. Um, and it's really just about uh, you know getting the buy-in from an ALCO or a board saying, yes, we like the idea of an external examiner coming in at short notice, requiring us to give up two, three hours of a day or three, three and a half a day all meeting in a room virtually or otherwise, and then going through the simulations and seeing what how effective we are as a collective. So I think there's value there, but uh, certainly the same process can be used for more severe stress testing all the way on to a reverse stress test as well. Yeah, absolutely. If I can just add one, one point. We also say in the flyer that uh, we, we recommend that um, users appoint a point of contact in the bank because then we can uh, tailor the scenario so that we really hit the pain points and make it so severe as as, that it, as, as requests in this case um, that it triggers reverse stress testing um, severity. Okay, uh, thank you guys. Now I have definitely not missed any more questions because I am right at the bottom of the scrolling. So, uh, David, I I hope that answers your question. Um, and. I guess uh, just some final thoughts from from both of you. Uh, first, Michael, please. Yeah, from from my perspective, um, I think this can be closely linked, uh, as I said before, with a with a regular CFP test or uh, liquidity contingency plan. I mean, I, I I'm I think it's a fantastic idea, and and Michael, it's uh, with list credit where credit's due here. It's, it's, it, when Michael first suggested to me, I thought, what a fantastic idea. The BTRM, as, as those of you who are, some of the delegates may not be completely familiar with it, Chris, um, as befits a, a modest gentleman of the old school, he didn't mention that he's actually head of faculty at the BTRM. He's not just on the faculty. <laughs> uh, but all of us here are are, are educators in so far as the BTRM is a professional qualification. Uh, our students are practitioners, 99% of the time, but it's a professional qualification. Uh, but the faculty are all practitioners, uh, either uh, current or most recently, um, various stages of full time and semi retired. But the faculty are practitioners. And I think going beyond the education side and saying, okay, we can take that observation, our experience from observing this around the world, different banks around the world. You, for those of you familiar with the faculty, you'll see it's a, it's a veritable United Nations <laughs> of different uh, different uh, nationalities from around the world, different languages. So I think there's about, the last count, there's about, there's about 10 different languages spoken on the faculty, isn't there? Uh, so we, we, with that experience, I think, does enable us to then offer a kind of um, simulation tabletop, you know, short term, short duration simulation exercise, simply to see simply for a board or an ALCO or, and an ALCO or an ALCO to assess how effective they think they will be in the, in the event of a real crisis. Uh, and uh, to me, it was a natural progression from being an educator to simply providing a service that enables you know, eff effectiveness of decision-making. Um, it's all within our space here. And it's such an area of, 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 um, of regulator oversight now. Um, it's such a, it's, it's, there's so much emphasis on responding to stress. Operational resilience is now taking up lots of time for regulators around the world. Uh, and this, to me, I think, ticks a lot of boxes. So uh, that, I think that's, uh, that's how I'll s s sum up there, um, Chris, if I may. Thank you. Okay, uh, brilliant. Uh, a, a long comment has just come through from Kalyana Raman. 
um, who's in Singapore. I haven't quite managed to take it all in. Just bear with me a sec. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, brilliant. He's going to ask questions later. So, uh, just a, a final wrap up. Uh, thanks uh, for all your time, uh, Maura, Michael, and for all of the delegates. Um, if uh, we've said anything that's interesting uh, to you, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us at inquiries at btrm.org. I'll just repeat that inquiries at btrm.org. Um, Actually, if one of you guys could put that in the chat, yeah, um, I'll do that. Now. And then I'll just say that the, the the final piece is that everybody who's registered will get an email with a recording of this session, also the slides we've used, and a, a brief marketing document. Um, you will also be given an opportunity uh, to book a chat with a faculty member if you want to take this any further. So, uh, thank you all ever so much for your time and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, and if we could just get that, did that get in the chat? The... I've, I've put in the email address. Yes, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. See, there's there's right. a comment above actually. What kind of action in regards to stress events do you suggest? Well, Michael is the better one to answer this. I, I would have thought in each time at each phase of the simulation exercise, there's a range of options given you and the board or the ALCO are going to arrive at a consensus on one there will be one that the btrm faculty would have an opinion on but that's not said until the alco of a pine is that right michael that is exactly right and it's also i think it, if you move along the severity spectrum or the severity continuum different actions uh will be will be discussed okay um how can we yeah, i've seen I mean, another one here how can we get hold of the slides sorry if already answered i think um Chris, did you mention that the recording plus the slides are being sent to all the registration? Uh, delegates? Yes, yes, it's okay. being sent to everybody who registered. Okay, great. Um, I just just going back to that that question about what kind of action in regards to stress events do you suggest? Um, and I don't think any banks, or certainly none I've come across, have this. Is that kind of idea of of grading the problem? And deciding if it if it's this particular grade of problem, we do these six things, and if it's that if it's a different grade, then we do these other ten things as well. Um, I I my experience is that uh, although there was a lot of focus initially after the financial crisis, since then it's become a more of a okay, we have to look at it every so often, but there's there's not focus on it. Uh, so we are maybe facing like a, a COVID type reaction when we get there, uh, because we we haven't really worked out what we're going to do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> rings a bell, rings a bell, Chris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. I'm going to call it to a close now. Everybody will get the slides, the recording, etc. And you've seen on the chat facility how to contact us. Uh, thanks for your time, and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.